Everybody, this is Mel Allen. Baseball is sure in the peak of health. In New York, Dr. K writes a winning prescription. Take 12 in a row and call me in the morning. And keep on taking your winning formula. Signs and symptoms in Cincinnati. Dr. Dave returns home a resident and gives the Reds a booster shot to keep pace in the race. Huge medical breakthroughs in Los Angeles, where the Dodgers find a cure for early season ills and cause a big clap in the West. Good old Yankee know-how puts the Red Sox in critical condition. Bruised, but maybe not broken. So heed doctor's orders and get set for a house call from this week in baseball. <laughs> National League focus. In New York, the Mets raised a ruckus. It's been a banner year for the Mets, who withstood the Cubs' efforts to knock them out of first place. In game one, red-hot Wally Backman kept his thermometer on the rise with three hits, including the tiebreaker in the seventh, to put the Mets ahead to stay. Keith Hernandez, also on the upswing, contributed to the Mets' 16 hits as New York won 6-4, making it five straight wins for the Mets and five straight losses for the Cubs. Met pitching was a key that busted up the Cubs. Reliever Roger McDowell gave up one hit through three innings as Chicago sank ten games back on the skids with a hobbled pitching staff. Last year, Chicago, I think, went for a quick fix, and they traded a lot of their young pitchers, a lot of their young talent, off to get uh, guys like Sutcliffe and, and Eckersley, and now they, these guys are hurt. They don't have the young talent to come up and help them out. The big thing that's hurting him right now is losing his big three. As for Davey Johnson's big wheel, Dwight Gooden rolled over the Cubs in game two. Striking out nine, the good doctor won his league-leading 12th straight game, boosting his record to 18 and three. With talent like that, the Mets are sure impressing their former coach. Gooden is the big difference. I mean, this guy's a superman. He's gonna be a great pitcher. And uh, from the time that I was here, of course, I think that, that Gary Carter uh, has been the big difference in the lineup. We had just gotten Keith Hernandez the last year that I was in New York. He made a big difference. Now Gary Carter is also a guy that I think has made a big difference from 84 to 85 with all the other good things that have happened with the young kids that they brought up to the big leagues. They got a lot of good things. Gary Carter had a lot of good stuff in the finale. Two home runs and four RBIs as New York won six straight from the Cubs, who had done the very same to the Mets last August to knock them out of first place. Ed Lynch went the route for win number 10 as the Mets won 6-2, handing the Cubbies loss number seven in a row. Next night, Sid Fernandez against the Phillies kept the Metses rolling, striking out 13 Phillies. New York won four to three for number eight in a row, then made it nine straight the next night before they lost. Now to Philadelphia, where the willy-nilly Phillies stayed chilly. Despite hopes to patch up a disappointing season, the Phillies slumber party continued when St. Louis came to the bet. Joaquin Andahar had just enough of the right stuff to become the Majors' first 18-game winner, and in his next start, picked up win number 19. Next night, Willie McGee went on a hitting spree, seven hits and five RBIs in the doubleheader to boost his league-leading average to 351 as St. Louis swept into a first-place tie with the Mets. Jeff Lottie picked up two saves in the series, raising his total to 14 as the Redbirds took three out of four, but they still fell off the top of the heap. 
Then the Cards pulled another pitching ace out of their sleeve when John Tudor beat Pittsburgh eight to one for win number 14 in 15 decisions. In all, a 207 ERA and 15 wins. As for St. Louis, two straight over the Bucks and a step out of first. Next stop, Los Angeles, where Dodger blue skies prevailed. After winning the opener, the Reds ran afoul of Pedro Guerrero. The Dodger outfielder provided the gamer the next night when he smashed home run number 28. Bob Welch beat Cincinnati 3-1 for his seventh straight win, then made it eight straight his next time out, lowering his ERA to 1.67. In game three, L.A. cleaned out the Reds' chances of picking up ground. Fernando Valenzuela squeezed past Cincy two to one for win number six in a row and number 13 overall. Then following a Jerry Roy shutout, the Dodgers pushed the Reds seven games back. L.A. was a tower of pitching power next night, thanks to Rick Honeycutt, who two hit the Braves three to nothing giving the Dodgers their league-leading 18th shutout. Causing a real flap on offense, veteran Enos Cabell continued to play a key role in L.A.'s success story, driving in two runs for his fourth game winner as the Dodgers racked up win number four in a row. Providing sweet treats from the bullpen, Tom Niedenfuhr picked up save number 10 as L.A. swept three from the Braves to keep waltzing in the West, 23 games above 500 and eight games on top of the pack. Now let's open the notebook for this week in baseball's twib notes from around the National League. Dale Murphy helped the Braves take three out of four from the Giants by smacking three home runs for a season total of 30, most in the league. Murph has really got the Giants number. Just witness his career numbers against them. In 137 games, 40 homers, 107 RBIs. The Cubs' Thad Bosley, two-timed Montreal, first with a three-run pinch hit homer to tie the score, then staying in the game, he brought the Cubs back again with a two-run shot as Chicago won eight to seven to end its seven-game losing streak. Keith Hernandez of the Mets has been poking them in the pinch, and he leads the majors with 19 game-winning RBIs, just three shy of the single-season record. Now, for this week's quiz, can you name the player who holds the Major League record for most game-winning RBIs in one season? Stay tuned for a hitter who can really sock the ball. American League scene. In Boston, the Sox unravel at Fenway. It wasn't exactly bombs away when the Yankees came to Fenway, since they struck one by one in the opener with 19 hits, 17 of which were singles. A big swinger at the singles party was Billy Sample, who gave the Red Sox an ample sample of hitting. Three for three with two RBIs as New York won 10 to six. The festivities continued in game two as Joe Cowley beat the sagging Sox seven to three for win number 10, getting a little help from his friend at first, Don Mattingly. Dave Rigetti came on for his third straight appearance and 21st save as New York won number five in a row. In game three, Boston traded in for a new power supply, but raging Ron Guidry turned off the current, raising his record to 15 and four with his first victory at Fenway since 1979. 
Brian Fisher saved the 5-3 win with one and a third shutout innings as New York swept its first series in Boston in five years. Moving on to Chicago, the Yankees blew past the White Sox in game one as Ron Hassey shot the breeze with two home runs. Good for four RBIs as New York won the game 10 to four. Phil Necro went the route for career win number 295 as the Yankees took two out of three from the Sox to stay in the race. Now to Seattle, where the Oakland A's stayed on a craze. Seattle's highly acclaimed Kitty Corps was no match for the visiting A's, who knocked out 51 hits and 34 runs, and taking three out of four at the Kingdom. Cleaning up against the Mariners, Oakland got a big hand from its A-plus veterans led by Dave Kingman, who smashed home run number 22 of the season, but more importantly, number 400 of his career, becoming the 21st player ever to reach that milestone. Dusty Baker, another experienced swinger, used his clout to hit one out while driving in five runs in the series. Donnie Hill may not be a veteran, but he's learning fast, and against Seattle had nine hits and seven RBIs, boosting his average to 372 since mid-July. Mike Davis went eight for 16 in the four games, as Oakland raised its team average to 269, third best in the league. Seattle bats also fell flat against the A's pitching. Rookie Tim Burtzis sank the Mariners in one game, 11 to five, to go nine and two. Don Sutton beat Seattle for career win number 291, and then got number 292 next time out. Now, let's review this week in baseball's twib notes from around the American League. 40-year-old Tom Seaver of the Chicago White Sox followed up career victory number 300 by reaching another milestone in a game against Milwaukee when he picked up career strikeout number 3,500 to become only the fifth pitcher in baseball history to claim that distinction. Reggie Jackson of the Angels raised the roof in Seattle's kingdom when he blasted home run number 18 of the season and career number 521. That clout put Reggie in some pretty fair company, tying him with Ted Williams and Willie McCovey for number eight on the all-time home run list. Baseball lost a dear friend when Yankee clubhouse attendant Pete Sheehy died at age 75. Going back to the days of Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, Sheehy was a part of the great Yankee tradition for 59 years. When I came out of the Army, I started to put the, the shirts on hangers. Every shirt is on a hanger down the line, if you notice, see? I got that from the Army. So long, Pete. Harold Baines of the White Sox had 22 game-winning RBIs in 1983, most by any major leaguer in one season since that statistic began in 1980. By the way, Jack Clark, now with St. Louis, had 21 game winners for the Giants in 1982, tying him for the National League record with Keith Hernandez, who sparked the 82 world champion Cardinals with his 21 game winning RBIs. What's the word, hummingbird? Oops. Tune's just falling flat, I guess. Well, not to worry, because it looks like you're not the only one who's falling apart at the seams. Oh, man, where's...
where's all this fallout coming from? Better drop out of sight for a while until the coast is clear. Only trouble is, major leaguers aren't the only ones falling out of line. Let's steer clear of this whole mess and hand out a handful of hearty helpings from the defensive corps. Up first, Angel Dick Schofield. Chicago White Sox, Ozzie Gijan. New York Yankee, Billy Sample. Out of the blue, Baltimore's Cal Ripken. New York Met, George Foster. Milwaukee's Paul Householder in for a crash landing. Dwayne Murphy, Oakland A's. Yankee, Don Mattingly to Willie Randolph for a nifty double play. Minnesota's Greg Gagne to Kent Herbeck for two again. A deflector to Julio Franco, Cleveland. White Sox, Ozzie Gijan making an encore. The Angels, Doug DeSensei. Oakland, Steve Kiefer. Cleveland's Brett Butler. And finally, Chicago's Rudy Law, over and out. Time now to zero in on a Cincinnati kid. Rebound for glory. A most welcome sign in Cincinnati has been the resurgence of Dave Parker, who's helping the Reds challenge in the West with a 305 average, 82 RBIs, and 22 home runs, all among league leaders. Once a power broker with the Pirate Lumber Company of the 1970s, Parker did a flourishing business with five 300-plus seasons, two batting titles, and the Most Valuable Player Award. The Pirates were also in their glory, and in 1979, bucked the odds to beat Baltimore in the World Series. 79 was an interesting year for the Pirates because we seemed to have uh, uh, came back all year. I can recall 3-1 to one when we was down 3-1 to one and we went back home to Pittsburgh uh, to play Baltimore there and they introduced to Baltimore's lineup and I can recall Pat Kelly dancing on the foul line as if that they had had it and I think that sparked our whole ball club from seeing them come out and uh, uh, dance uh, during the introductions. I think it kind of did something to the ball club and we went in and, and we kind of talked amongst ourselves and we were determined to come back and beat them from that incident. And they did, taking the last three games for a fantastic finish. Parker turned in a grand series performance, hitting 345. It was the crowning of a standout season in which the Cobra also sparkled in the All-Star game. Well, the 1979 All-Star game was uh, played in Seattle, uh, uh, which I had played in dome stadiums before, but uh, Seattle was, was a little different than the Houston Astrodome. Dome. I think they had dec decorated the roof in, in uh, red, white, and blue, uh, real patriotic uh, decorations. And there was a couple of fly balls that, that was hit that got in, in, in up in the, the white part of the decorations. And I can recall uh, misjudging one on Jim Rice. I lost the ball in the ceiling and took a high bounce, and Jim was rounding the second base at that particular time. And I just turned and, and grabbed the ball, anticipating him probably being somewhere in the area between second and third, and turned and fired to third, and, and I got him there. The second throw in that 79 All-Star game was uh, a ball that uh, I think Greg Nettles hit to me. I knew it was a situation where uh, I had to make this play or they would have beat us in the All-Star game. So I, I took a, a, a heave of the ball uh, and I threw it all the way into a home plate and it ended up being a great play. Gary Carter made a good play on the ball. Two more All-Star appointments followed for Pittsburgh Superstar, but then Parker and Pirate fans had a falling out. And in 1984, the Cobra returned to his native Cincinnati as a member of the Reds. Right off the bat, Parker turned things around in Cincinnati. But even at age 33, 
Being the new kid in town wasn't easy at first. My first year, I felt some pressures uh, being a first-year player, but I am really uh, more relaxed uh, with this ball club now, and I'm healthy. I think the key to uh, my success has been my health and the fact that I can go out there every day and uh, concentrate basically on my job. And uh, you know, with those two factors, I think it's really been the key to me uh, having the year that I'm having so thus far. Number 39 is still mighty fine. This week, Old Spice salutes Baltimore's Eddie Murray. In a game against Cleveland, Steady Eddie slammed his 21st home run, the only Oriole ever to hit 20 or more nine straight times. And with 87 RBIs, he's just three shy of driving in at least 90 runs for the seventh season. Congratulations, Eddie. That's all for now, folks. See you next week on This Week in Baseball.